didn't have a great knowledge in the country, in Ireland, of wh where we were going, uh, what the climate would be like, uh, whether it would be bush, whether it would be uh, jungle, whether it would be built up cities. So really we were very unprepared uh, at that stage. My mother did not know where I was going, the Lord have mercy on her now. She came to the Cora here to see me off. Uh, my dad was dead since 47, but she did not have an idea where I was going. We were looking up on maps to see where, where was the place and we couldn't find it on the maps. And we were volunteering to go to this place. Don't forget, we were only three weeks getting together and there was lads going out on patrol and still affected by inoculations and various other things. The whole, they were in the heat. On top of that, like, you know, inoculations against uh, malaria, typhoid, you name it. You had about 10 inoculations in one day. Teeth extractions, medicals, and this, that, and the other. You didn't get time to take. And we had a plastic bag, like a child would have going on a picnic with some sandwiches. That was our rations, if you like. You see the lads going on board with a little plastic bag in their hand. So we were off to uh, the great adventure. These massive planes. <laughs> God, how are they going to get off the ground? I remember there was fellas getting down the plane, holding their hand over their arm. And if anybody rushed against them, there was a squeal and you could get a belt in the jaw. They were after having the smallpox vaccination. But at this stage, it had come up into the big blister of a thing. In the early days, we went out in the Bulls Wall a heavy woolen tunic which was buttoned up to the neck. And the boots were the old studded boots, the hobnail boots. We were so far behind. I'd say secretly, probably people were, some of them were laughing at us. Like the Americans, they couldn't believe where, where are these coming from. We were kind of a tourist attraction type. All the Americans were pointing at us. They thought we were going to the North Pole, in fact, one fellow said. In France. We then flew to Tripoli, to an American base. We then flew to Kano, and that's when the heat hit it. I thought I was at the walk in front of a jet engine <clears throat> because the heat was blowing off the desert. And we had never experienced heat like that in our lives. So anyway, we discovered it wasn't a jet engine that was going to burn us. It was just the heat off the, uh, off the desert. When I landed in it first, my biggest disappointment after watching Tarzan films and stuff like that, my biggest disappointment when I looked out the back door of the aeroplane we were on, there were no trees. There was only little sort of bush scrub. I was expecting big, tall trees. <laughs> Standards were much higher. Uh, like Elizabethville and Leopoldville were huge, big modern cities, big skyscraper hotels, outdoor swimming pools. There was no comparison to Dublin. Was come down to November about two months before the ambush or in around a month or whatever and we went out there to see what the problem was there was a whole lot of people dead and uh, that was a bit scary it was our job to repair any bridges so we kept doing this day after day we'd fix the bridge they'd pull it down we'd go back fix the bridge they'd pull it down it was a matter of perseverance so that went on for a couple of weeks. So 
they weren't too angry with us. We weren't too angry with them. But then a few things started to happen. They seemed to believe that we were maybe taken over for the Belgians. Colonials had left off. That was my feeling about it. Where one day they seemed to be friendly enough, angry but friendly. They started to become more hostile. And then we have the events of what happened on the 8th of November. And I told him, whatever you say or whatever you do, be very, very careful with the Balubas. They are very, very dangerous. No problems, he said. They know we are the United Nations and that we are here to help them. Somebody rolled out Baluba cats. And of course, I put out my head to see, and I saw a fellow with a leopard skin hat and a bow and arrow. And another fellow with a white shirt, a pair of shorts, and a bow and arrow. And Gleason and uh, Skeiner went down to talk to them. The altitude from the Iris was that they thought that everyone was friendly. We can do that, we can go to that village. And, I, I, and that took a long time for me to convince this is war. Then the Balubas came from behind, screaming, shouting. That was the last. That was the last moment for them to man all weapons. In our tradition, there's an in-base uh, appreciation that violence solves nothing, and that you should release a shot or fire a shot just uh, in the last uh, extremity. The Balubas then attacked Lieutenant Gleason, tried to say Yambu, and then he got an arrow. And he went down on Monday, now he the ghost down, and he told us to withdraw into the bush. Hey, cover lads, we're all going to be killed. And they attacked from, uh, yeah, in principle, from all directions. And uh, it was only a question of time before everybody was killed. The patrol should be back by 4 o'clock, 1600 hours. That's normal procedure, because at 1800, 6 o'clock, it would be dark. So it came to 5 o'clock, 1,700 hours, no sign. So by darkness then, it was obvious they weren't going to come. We were informed that a patrol, a rescue group was on route from Albertville, 200 kilometers from the It was going to take them many hours to get to us. We couldn't launch a rescue. We had no transport, that was all gone with the patrol. So about five o'clock in the morning, all 500, we could see in the east the vehicles coming. Myself and seven other guys were dead. We came with the rescue, <clears throat> rescue unit uh, the day after. I proceeded into the bush, so 60 paces. And in a small clearing I found the bodies of Lieutenant Gleason and Sergeant Gamer. They had been badly mutilated. We then carried on the search, and we found uh, several bodies. One body we didn't find, and Tony Browns we didn't find. After 10 minutes, Joe Fitzpatrick appeared. I feel that I'm, I'm just a very, very lucky man to be sitting here today 
Jesus and Mary, I nearly pray to them every day for getting out of Nyimba. Of course, you had people that said you ran away. You know, you're sitting in a pub or something and you're still running and you all these remarks, uh, in the end, those, is that what you call them? No one ever apologised. It took me 47 years to get this Medal of Honour. Me family name to start. I'm content enough. He died on the 31st of October, and on the 2nd of October, or the 2nd of November, I should say, uh, I was informed of his death. So I went down then to the barracks to ask them to send him home, and they told me if I sent the he's fair, they'd get him home. At that time, there was no repatriation unless you were able to pay your own fair home. But I hadn't got the money, because we had very small money from the army that time, and... Uh, I said, I haven't got the money. So I had to get the child buried myself. They decided they'd send me home with the bodies as part of the escort. This was eight or nine days after the lads had been killed. The stench was incredible. You can imagine, it was the worst trip I ever had in my life. Captain Borden, Dermot Borden at that time, I said, OK, we'll keep going. So we got back to Elizabethville about 5 o'clock that evening to find that there was a military operation to take place the following morning of arresting the various Belgian officers that in Elizabethville and the area. They were trying to get a political solution to all their troubles and all the politicians, if you would call them politicians, were gathered together in the Louvenium. I was in charge of the cigarettes and the sweets and other things of that nature that the Congolese would like uh, were under my control. And they were given chits, which they had to hand in to me and sign for their ration of goodies. And in that way, I met them all. They had to come up and sign the book. The uh, task of our company, A Company, was to take over the gendarme headquarters, which was in the centre of the city. And uh, at this stage, I had never even seen the actual target. And my mission, particularly number three platoon, was to take over and set up roadblocks outside the gendarme headquarters. And at five o'clock on that morning, on the 28th of August, this big palace came into, into view. And there was a couple of sentries at the gate, gendarme sentries. Just they flew over there. And there was an armor care boat that went in the gate real fast. And I was in a, the Willie's Jeep. Flew in the gate too. Jumped off the Willie's Jeep and entered the palace. Get in if you could. Luckily enough, as we rounded the corner outside the gendarme headquarters, the sentries had disappeared. And very quickly we set up our roadblocks. And just as we were setting the roadblocks up, we heard the first bursts of fire. At that stage, Combatant Quinlan. Uh, led the charge in an APC through the gates of the gendarme headquarters and in the space of 15 minutes had captured the headquarters itself plus the guard of approximately 30 Katangans. My own platoon uh, arrested four Belgian mercenary officers and one of them actually handed me his pistol when we arrested him uh, as he was driving into the headquarters. To were annoyed, uh, one particular guy, uh, my platoon commander, uh, the late Colonel Joe Leach, uh, was trying to question him and get his name, and he wouldn't. 
he didn't want to give any information. So he had a, a Beretta pistol. So Joe took the pistol off him and he was very annoyed about that. So eventually he gave his name on that. But no one was killed in that engagement and they gave in quite readily and we captured all the uh, Belgian officers as they reported in for work that morning and later saw them being uh, deported. But we didn't really see them as the enemy. And I got an order to get one section of my platoon, that would be 10 men, get onto a DC Dakota um, aircraft, fill it with mercenaries and fly to Camina and handed them over to the, the 1st Infantry Group, an Irish unit, in Camina. All in all, it was a long day and it was a hectic day. Not one I'd easily forget. I was the first Irish officer ever to go into Jadaville. When I got there with my platoon, which was about 36 soldiers, Mida was there to greet me, and obviously he had itchy feet, and he only had about eight to ten soldiers with him. All others had left. And he told me that we were in a very dangerous place, that we shouldn't be here, that's in Jadaville. And uh, I asked him for a briefing, and he said, I've just given it to you, you shouldn't be here, it's dangerous. And with that, he mounted up in a vehicle and he left. And on the second night, quite a substantial mob, I would call them, of people came out from the town of Jadaville. Now, they were all white people and uh, they were very threatening to us. And naturally, we were armed and we produced uh, quite a number of troops who put on the, the gas masks and got gas canisters ready because these people were very angry. Consequent to that, it was decided by battalion headquarters and Katanga Command that B Company, our company, should about turn the following day and go back to Elizabethville. We were brought out to uh, Jadaville in trucks supplied by the UN. And all that was remained of these when they went back after dropping us in Jadaville was one broken down truck two jeeps, one ambulance, and the company commander's car. As we moved around the place in our jeeps, as we went out to show the flag and to reassure the population, we were hindered at every turn by gendarmerie who had set up roadblocks. They also drove uh, truckloads of troops through our position, and they could do that because the road ran through our position. Our position had been selected by a civilian United Nations person not for any military advantage, but merely as a place to lodge. When Commandant Quinlan decided to meet the uh, burgomaster in the town uh, and was told uh, to remove himself and his company and UN from Jadotville immediately, and uh, it was fairly obvious that the white population did not want us there and that we were not welcome. So the first thing that was done as soon as we landed in Jadaville was to dig in. You know, because he, he must have, maybe he heard something, or maybe there was rumours going about, I, I, I don't know. But. Troops got more and more passing by, bigger trucks, more troops, heading toward into uh, Jadaville from Elizabethville. So they were building up troops all the time. We could see the gendarmerie digging in around us. And I think at that stage there were several efforts to have us withdrawn, which were ignored. My father became very much aware very, very quickly that the mission he was given in, to, in Jadaville was really not uh, a good mission. And I know that he sent uh, the doctor, uh, Commandant Joe Cloon, and uh, Captain Liam Donnelly back to Elizabethville to uh, ask for maybe a different mission. Uh, I know that this was discussed with uh, Cruz O'Brien, and the result was anyway, they were told to stay in Jadaville. The mission hadn't changed. We were about due to leave when a message, a radio message came, well, don't come back, we're surrounded. And I think the most important thing that we took that time was, was a small truck out of pack rations. The gendarmes were patrolling on the hour uh, by our camp, and our company commander told us to just act normal as if nothing was wrong or nothing happening. 
So um, he had us digging the trenches at night and we, we were annoyed over this and gave him a, a few swears. <laughs> but uh, little did we know how valuable those trenches were going to be to us. A call came from battalion headquarters in Elizabethville stating that Operation Mortar had taken place. All installations had been captured by the United Nations troops and that to inform Combatant Quinlan uh, to be on the alert. Five minutes before they attacked us at Mass, that's when he found out about Operation Martyr. And even then they didn't tell the truth. They said it was a complete success. My eye, everyone in the country except us knew about Operation Martyr, including the Gendarmerie who were waiting for them. Were you were prepared for it. Well, when men were at Mass at this time, except the two fellows who were in the trenches, which was normal local protection. Uh, Mass had just started, as a matter of fact, and uh, firing broke out about a party about a platoon tried to rush our position and fired, and they were driven off. Uh, that was our first indication of what really happened. Everyone was in their trenches and waited and waited and waited. So it was very quiet all over, an eerie, eerie situation. And then about 11 o'clock in the morning, it started. I was a qualified mortar officer, so I knew exactly when I heard the first pops of, of the weapons being fired that they were actually mortars. And my, my reaction was I could not believe that we were being mortared. This was very quickly followed by the rattle of uh, heavy machine guns. And very quickly then, our own troops went into action, firing uh, Vickers machine guns and firing the 60mm uh, mortars in, in addition to small arms fire. Would it be able to pull a tree or any human being? That was my biggest worry. And of course when the time came, you never even thought of it, it came automatic. If someone stopped up in front of you, if you saw a target, you shot and that was it. Who's going to be the best man at the end of the day? That's how you feel. There's no in between. You just fight. But it is hard to shoot people that you have nothing against. It's very hard to do that. But there's no other way. They were very brave men, these in Germany. They were rushing a defended position and they were not getting very far and they were suffering tremendous casualties, as we heard afterwards, which is not something anyone takes any pride in. Within about 200 yards of our positions, they stopped and very, very quickly then started to withdraw and uh, made their way back towards Janetville. Needless to remark, we were absolutely thrilled that we had beaten off this attack. We were, we were highly elated and uh, the question was, uh, will there be another attack? So we had to stay on the alert for the rest of that, that day and in addition, listen to our colleagues being martyred and machine gunned up in number one platoon and support platoon areas. We could see the movement of the troops and were firing. And every time we saw somebody, we'd fire on them. And unfortunately, I got shot then, that time, about that time. I got shot through the thigh, went up across my thigh and up into my stomach, out, out the other direction. So, And as soon as I got his natural enough, being foolish and un inexperienced, I jumped up. And when I jumped up, I was hit from the front in the chest just to the right of the chest, so the bullet hit the magazines and killed the power. So it didn't actually hit me, but it exploded all the magazine, all the, the rounds in the magazine. So that's how close I was to seeing no more action for that day, forever. And Combatant Joe Clone was the medical officer, and he cleaned out the wounds, and he, he patched them up as well as he could, 
So the next morning I was able to hobble around, so I was back out again in the trenches. First of all, we heard around uh, 1,600 hours, we could hear the mortar fire at the Lafira Bridge. We could clearly hear mortars and machine guns, and this fire lasted maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Suddenly it was decided by the commander that we would pull back and we would review the situation and we would make another attack at first light. That was the following morning. Well, we were looking to see their heads coming over the hill any minute. But they never arrived. And uh, I wasn't surprised because it, was le it left so long. And the following morning, it was decided at battalion headquarters that we didn't have sufficient strength, we didn't have martyrs, etc., etc., that we'd come back, regroup, and a much stronger force would be put in position.